With that, I'm going to introduce the first speaker. Dr. Malcolm Munro is one of the national and international leading experts on the physics and the fundamental principles of electrosurgery. Surgery, and that is all I'm going to say because he has a very detailed presentation and I urge you to listen very carefully to what he says because if you understand what he says, you'll understand most of what comes after him. Malcolm, <coughs> thank you very much. Thanks very much. <coughs> Thanks very much, Leanne and Pascal, for including me in this process. So uh, what we're going to do really is to start this off uh, by talking about radio frequency electricity. And um, these are our objectives. And uh, I'll just throw those up. And the first one is we're going to try to, as Leanne suggested to you, uh, change the way you use terminology. Uh, my belief is that until we do that, uh, until people are actually using the right words to describe the same things, um, confusion reigns. So these terms, and I even heard them up here within the last three minutes, we don't want to hear anymore. Uh, except when we discuss the history of electrosurgery, Bovee is very important, but the Bovee machine, and by the way, there is a, there is a proprietary Bovee uh, company, um, and the proprietary machine uh, is, is there as well. So Bovee, Hot Bovee, all those sorts of things, we want to get rid of those. And we would like to replace them with some other terminology. So uh, electrosurgical generator or unit, you can use those interchangeably. Um, we don't cauterize things. We are actually trying to create different effects. So we have to have names for those effects. And uh, vaporizing and cutting are, are related. Uh, desiccation and coagulation are related. And fulguration is a special kind of coagulation. And we'll talk to you about that. Um, we have electrodes, and generally, they are either active or dispersive, and we'll explain what that means, but there is no grounding, and you'll learn what that uh, is about. And our instruments either have one electrode, in which case they're monopolar, or they have two electrodes, in which case they're bipolar. But all of your electrosurgery is bipolar. You need two electrodes. One, one has to be somewhere, uh, uh, even if it's not on the electrode. So what is RF electrosurgery? <clears throat> what it is, it's the intracellular conversion of electromagnetic energy to kinetic energy to thermal energy. So there are two conversions that occur. And what that then does uh, is that you can then take that effect and uh, uh, manifest that in tissue to either vaporize it, to coagulate it, or to fulgurate it. Okay? It is not cautery. So then you say, well, what's cautery? Got to be something, right? So cautery really is the passive uh, transfer of heat. So when you light a match and burn your finger, uh, when you're branding uh, your neighborhood bull, that is cautery, okay? But you're not heating instruments and then passing it onto tissue. Um, and there is a company who's just released a product that actually does that, but net that. With radio frequency electricity, we are actually uh, uh, heating the tissue, which then hits the instrument. So we need some some background. So the first thing is to get some of these terms down. So this kind of harkens you back to uh, physics class in high school or college. We've got current voltage impedance or resistance, power and energy. And current really reflects to the, uh, the flow of electrons past a point in the circuit uh, in a given time. And it's uh, really the number of coulombs, which is a big bunch of those electrons per second. And voltage is really a pressure concept. It's the difference in electropotential or electrical potential between two points in the circuit. So that difference is the represents the, in essence, the force uh, of pushing electrons through a circuit. And it's measured in joules per coulomb or volts. Now, impedance and resistance are two similar terms. We use the term resistance in direct currents, but in, in alternating currents, which is what we're talking about today, we use the term impedance. So it's the degree to which the circuit, or some portion of the circuit, impedes the flow uh, of ionic material. It could be electrons, uh, usually. And it's measured in ohms. Power is a product of two of the above. It's a product of the voltage and the current. And it's measured in watts, uh, which are the, a joule per second. And then finally, energy is, as you know, capacity of a force to do work and it's measured in joules. So those are the five uh, entities that we're talking about. 
And if we try to relate some of these in this uh, relationship called Ohm's law, where the current uh, is directly proportional to the voltage and inversely proportional to the impedance, we can look at this in this water tower analogy. So if we have a water tower here that you open a spigot and, it, and the water flows out, um, the height of that water tower above the ground can reflect the voltage, that's a pressure, okay? And the amount of water flowing through that spigot is current, and the width of that spigot can be conceived as resistance or impedance. So what would happen if we increase the voltage? Well, how would we do that? We would lift the water tower up, so now the voltage is higher because the difference between the two points in the circuit is now greater. Huh? And so if we turn that on, uh, increasing our voltage, as you can see in the formula up there, will increase the amount of current. Well, what if we ran into impedant tissue, highly impedant tissue? Well, that would be effectively the same as narrowing the spigot. So if everything else is the same, and we turn on the spigot, we will get reduced current flow. So you say, well, what does this have to do with me operating, okay? So some of you will see that when you're working in highly impedant tissue like fat, your generator may not be as effective. Or it also could be more highly impedant because of scarring. It could be either scarring from previous surgery or previous injury, or it could even be scarring that you induce. Tissue that you've already coagulated on the gallbladder bed, for example, becomes highly impedant. So let's try to understand what electrosurgical generators are. And really it's what does this thing do? And fundamentally what it does is it takes that 60 hertz, 60 cycle per second alternating current, and it converts it to one that's 500,000 cycles per second or thereabouts. And when you drive your car and you're looking at the radio and that 570 on the AM dial, that's 570,000 hertz or 570 kilohertz, and that's why it's called radio frequency. And that has some implications in interfer interfering with other instruments. So your generators do other things as well. They allow you to adjust voltage and uh, really by adjusting wattage. Uh, they allow you to uh, control the duty cycle. And the more advanced devices, which you'll hear about, do even more than that. <coughs> but all of them have an isolated circuit. There is, there, there probably hasn't been a ground referenced uh, generator sold in this country probably for an operating room use for 30 or 40 years. There still are some out there. So what does this mean? And this is, this is getting rid of the term ground because you guys don't use grounding pads, all right? And a uh, ground reference circuit uh, is not uh, connected. The, the pad, if you will, is not connected to the generator. Uh, the circuit is completed through the ground. But all of your uh, generators that you use um, have a connection to, what am I pointing at? Connection to uh, the generator. So these are isolated circuits. These are not grounding pads. These are dispersive electrodes. So why do we use RF? Well, RF is kind of interesting. Um, it's actually quite controllable and quite predictable as long as you understand what you're using. At, and at above 100,000 hertz or 100 kilohertz, it doesn't depolarize nerves, it doesn't depolarize muscle. That's why your patient or you don't go into cardiac arrest uh, when this energy goes through you. Uh, so it's a very interesting energy uh, source in that regard. Now, what's direct current? Well, if we think of the battery that uh, we use in this, uh, in this laser or in your toothbrush, there's a positive and a negative pole in that battery. And that's constant. So what happens is, if you put that on an oscilloscope like this, you would have a deflection one way, and you'd have a flow of current in one way. So there's a current flow. With alternating currents, it's different. What does alternating mean? It means there's alternating polarity. So the poles are changing. How fast are they changing? In this, they're changing 500,000 times a second. So there is no dedicated return electrode, if you will. That's, that's a, a misnomer. This, this is not a unidirectional circuit. Think of the current more as oscillating uh, at the tissue level. So we're still talking about generators, and there are basically two waveforms uh, that are produced. The first um, is 
uh, and that yellow button reflects what you're used to, at least in North America, which is the so-called cut mode, um, which is a problematic term. Uh, and this is a low voltage, uh, continuous output. And if we uh, switch over to the so-called coagulation mode, also a misnomer, uh, at the same uh, wattage, we have a much higher voltage and it's interrupted. And we're going to explain this, but these are your basic two types of output. So if we look at the, uh, uh, we'll set this at pure and we'll dial it up to 30 watts and we'll turn it on. And if we have our oscilloscope, this is what this looks like. Right? A continuous sine wave. And if we say, well, let's turn it up, and we turn it up to, say, 100, what do we get? We get the same sine wave, but with higher voltage. Okay? You're seeing um, a voltage around zero, and the sum of those two are the peak-to-peak -peak voltage. Now, if we uh, try to do, uh, create blend, of sort of blended output, what are we doing? Well, blend, I think most people think, has got something to do with dialing up the coag and dialing up the cut. Not true. Cut should be, the coag can be at zero. All blend is, is modulation of that so-called cut or low voltage output. So if I set my uh, blend circuit on uh, here, and uh, what you can see now is that there's an interruption in the output. That voltage is higher than the voltage if it was at continuous output, because we have to maintain that power equation there, right? So if we actually interrupt the, whoops, I keep doing this. If we interrupt the um, uh, current, so there's less current, that number goes down, then this number has to go up to keep this constant. So cut, blend is a way of getting higher voltage uh, output. Now, there's a term we use called duty cycle. So 100% duty cycle means the output's on all the time. And in this particular instance, it's only on 50% of the time. So if you're using, say, a force two generator from uh, Valley Lab, I've just used a name, but we have to use that example, that would be blend three. This would be blend two. This would be blend one. And you see, as we have more and more a higher duty cycle, the voltage comes down. The coag is at zero the whole time. It's got nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. That's one of my tests. So when I see somebody say, we put it at 40-40 blend, I know they don't know what's going on. Okay? So, now, let's go to the other one, and this is the so-called coag output, and here's what it looks like. And really, the major difference with this is it's a really short duty cycle. It's only on about 6% of the time in a typical output. So if you're cutting down the current, you've got to push the voltage. So the big difference between so-called coagulation and so-called cutting at the same wattage is the voltage is much different. It's much higher. And these, uh, this has very important uh, uh, implications in all sorts of aspects of electrosurgery, ranging from what happens with a pacemaker to the risks of things like capacitive coupling to damage to insulation on your instruments. Now, all electrosurgery is bipolar. There's no such thing as monopolar electrosurgery because there are two poles. There are always two electrodes. So what differentiates systems is the location and the purpose of that second electrode. So if we look at this, here's a monopolar instrument. Here's a patient, that, that blob. So there have to be two monopolar instruments in this system. One we call the active electrode. The second we call the dispersive electrode. All right? And so what happens is because that whole patient is interposed between the two electrodes, the whole patient has, there's the opportunity for current diversion. Now, a bipolar instrument has both electrodes on the instrument, okay? And so the only part of the patient involved is between the two electrodes. That's it. So with monopolar systems, you can divert all kinds of places. Bipolar systems, very difficult for that to happen. Now, how does this energy cause these cellular effects? Well, the first thing is to try to understand about temperature in cells. So if this is a normal temperature, as you know, what happens at about 50 to 60 degrees is that we can kill cells. It takes between one and six minutes. Once you get to 60 degrees centigrade, if a cell is at that temperature, it's instantaneous death of that cell. Now, 
So between 60 and 90, we have instantaneous death, and the two things that occur are desiccation and coagulation. We're going to explain those, but those are the two things that occur. If we instantaneously, instantaneously elevate cellular temperature to 100 degrees centigrade, we will get vaporization. So that's what happens. Now we're going to take you there, but that's the end point. So think of a cell. We've got these positive and negative ions, and if we apply a direct current to it, all the positives will migrate to the negative, all the negatives to the positive, like that. But that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with this oscillating, alternating circuit. So the alternating circuit causes those ions to go back and forth, and some of those are pretty big proteins. And so what happens initially with electrosurgery is that we get frictional forces occur in the cell, and those frictional forces are what is responsible for elevating the cellular temperature. So if we now describe the differences here, let's go into it. So with vaporization, we've got this oscillation going, we're elevating the temperature, and we're doing it really, really quickly. We get it to above 100 degrees centigrade. What happens? The water undergoes a conversion to gas. What happens when that happens? We get a massive expansion of volume. We also are damaging the cellular membrane, and poof, we get vaporization. That's what happens. Now, if we don't get it that high, we still get our elevated temperature, but we retain some integrity. So one thing that happens is we start losing water, so this cell starts shrinking, okay, it gets smaller. And so if we look at it on a macro level, we get the tissue going from that to that. But there's something else going on. There's protein in the cell. And this is what's important for forming your seal, or your vessel. So these proteins, what happens when we increase the temperature, there is hydrothermal rupture of these crosslinks, these hydrogen crosslinks. And then with the cooling, they reform. And so what you have there is a depiction of a shrunken, desiccated, and coagulated piece of tissue resulting from desiccation and protein coagulation. So now, let's take this sort of in a high-level perspective to surgery. So what are we doing? How do we actually create a tissue effect? Well, really, what you're doing is controlling power density. It isn't too much what's coming out of the generator, what current or what labels on the current. It's got to do with power density or current density. Okay? So most of you, many of you, have been in a backyard as a kid and you've had a magnifying glass like this, and what are you doing? You're taking the sun's energy and you're focusing it. And if you get the focal point right, you will cause elevation of the temperature of the stick that you're carving your girlfriend's name in, or initials into. All right? So that's what really happens with electrosurgery as well. We create our power density, and we, it's in watts per centimeter squared. It's really got to do with the area of the electrode that's near to or in contact with the tissue. So if we take a blade electrode like this and take it in two different orientations, okay, notice that the one on the left has the edge toward the tissue, whereas the one on the right is flat on the tissue. And we're going to take the output, and it's going to be uh, this one creates a high current density, if you will, the one on the left, and the one on the right is a medium current density, but we're going to use the same type of output, so-called cut, low voltage. And what do we do? On the one on the left with the high current density, we get vaporization. We're actually exploding the cells. The one on the right, we're getting desiccation. So, and we'll see if I can make this work. Um, this is exactly that. This is 50 watts. Nothing's changed. This is cutting output. And you can see that this was being used to vaporize. Now we'll rotate it, okay, do exactly the same thing, um, activate it, and we get desiccation. We go back again, turn it sideways, and now we're going to vaporize. So that's all 50 watts, so-called cut output. Now, so if we look at these tissue effects, Vaporization, low voltage output. Desiccation, coagulation, same output. Okay, we're using the yellow output. We could use these blended outputs as well, which is, as you know, uh, 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 now a modulated version. Now, if we're going to fulgurate, that's something different. That's where we use the so-called coagulation side. And, and it's this high voltage 
um, modulated uh, uh, low duty cycle. And we're using that for superficial uh, coagulation of relatively small arterioles and capillaries. Vaporization or cutting is really a non-contact process. You're not contacting the tissue ideally. Desiccation, coagulation is contact, and fulguration is non-contact. Now, <clears throat> let's look at it a little closer. So here we have our, our electrodes. So how do we actually vaporize or cut tissue? Well, we, we, we put the electrode near to the tissue, very near. We activate, we create a steam envelope, and then we extend it. That's what it is. So basically, cutting is linear vaporization. That's what it is. And here, you know, is an example of, of a hook uh, vaporizing, uh, and what you're seeing there is, is really non-contact and very little thermal, uh, th thermal effect. I'll show it to you in a different way here. Um, here is a, uh, there's the vaporized cell. Here's your electrode coming into contact, near contact. You vaporize, and then you stay in that steam envelope or that vapor envelope it's got lots of ions, so it's very low impedance, and uh, you carry that across. And again, Perfect. we can sort of see it here. Uh -huh. The sound doesn't need to be on. But there you have uh, uh, vaporization once again, or cutting. Now, with desiccation and coagulation, um, you're really thinking mostly about forming sound vessel seals. So if there's really one big thing to take away from this, is that if you're going to coagulate a vessel, you should perform it only with the low voltage output. You should perform it only using the cut, not the coag. And we're going to explain that, but that I'd like you to take away. But a lot of this is why, all right? Well, <clears throat> let's look what happens if you use this type of modulated voltage or modulated uh, current uh, high voltage and you bring the electrode close to the tissue. You get these sparks will fly and you'll get a, a zone of desiccation. And then what that actually does is it now acts as an insulator. And it actually, because we've got high impedance now, it actually will prevent the energy from completing the circuit because you've got an insulator. So what instead you really want to do is you want to use the low voltage, which really cooks this tissue very, very slowly, very slowly. And that is, is the appropriate way to do this. And all your so-called advanced bipolar devices all use this anyway. This more applies to what you're doing when you're using a, a generic device. So let's look at really what is happening and kind of put this all together when you're trying to desiccate. So we've got an, a, a cell tissue desiccation piece in the upper right-hand corner there. So you're seeing the cells shrink, you're seeing the tissue shrink. And the coagulation is over here. We're seeing this uh, unwinding and then rewinding and uh, uh, reattachment, reformulation uh, of the proteins. We're not destroying the protein the way we're doing with vaporization. We're maintaining it uh, and using it to create this seal. And um, we can do that with a very simple uh, device. Here's a, an old-fashioned uh, uh, paddle-based uh, device. And one of the issues, and you'll be talking about this later, is that these devices push a lot of uh, direct energy around the side the, you know, uh, of, of their edge. See all this, this stuff that's happening here? And if you actually watch what's actually happening here, is there's actually some thermal energy occurring um, in that uh, transfer to a place where you really don't want it to be. Now, <clears throat> so let's, let's look at these vessels a little bit more. If you're going to actually use energy to seal a vessel, you've got to, you've got to seal it. You've got to co-opt it. You've got to put the sides of the vessel together. If you leave the vessel looking like that, you're not going to seal anything. And in fact, there's a heat sink effect that will actually take the heat away from the target. And you may think you're doing something. You may see bubbling and cooking around the vessel, but you won't get that vessel seal. What you have to do is actually close that vessel like that. And then that protein uh, coagulation process can take place, and that blue line uh, can be obliterated by the proper formation of a seal. Let's look at it a different way. Uh, the top is using the so-called cutting output, and we get a nice seal. Uh, we get even coagulation, uh, whereas in the bottom, uh, we're going to use this modulated uh, coagulation scenario like this, and what we get are these little spot welds. And by the way, our device will likely stick to it as we open it up uh, and pull the tissue apart. And um, 
So, so it is a very ineffective sealing uh, mechanism, especially for larger vessels. Uh, here's um, <clears throat> a little animation that, you know, we'll, a little taste of what we'll be having in the online module. And uh, uh, here you're seeing the uh, coagulation and seeing all these gaps here, whereas when we use the cutting uh, or, or low voltage output, um, we see uh, a, a nice homogeneous uh, uh, closure. So a couple other things to look at. One is tissue compression, uh, low versus high. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, if one compresses tissue very firmly, you don't have to apply as much energy, whereas if you have a big, thick clump of tissue, you have to use far more joules. And the final thing I'm going to show you is fulguration, and we've talked about this a little bit. Uh, here's the modulated uh, output, which is what we want this time. Notice that it's in non-contact mode, and what happens is we get very superficial uh, coagulation. It will not go very deep, probably not much more than uh, half a millimeter. And fulguration, of course, uh, is something that we want to use only high voltage modulated current, no touch, and a large surface area electrode. And of course, this is found integrated uh, into these argon-based coagulators uh, that will be talked about later. So there you have it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting.